So um, I'm going to be drawing on motivational interviewing, which I'm going to assume everybody has some familiarity with. Um, but we'll do a little bit of. <laughs> I don't have a lot of familiarity. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we'll do a little get everybody up to speed, make sure we're relatively on the same page, and go from there. So yeah, so folks can finish with your phones and, and put them in a non-distracting place. That would be awesome. So I just want to get a sense. What I have noticed is everyone's like, oh, we've got a million trainings on motivational interviewing. I'm like, that's maybe good, maybe not so good. Um, but I think that one of the things that um, people haven't been feeling encouraged to do is use the, the skills and tools from motivational interviewing in the way they work with supervising individuals and working in teams. Um, so a lot of the skills that we, I think, feel pretty standard practice doing with patients don't necessarily cross over to that other realm. So my question just for the group so I can sort of teach to what you all know is um, how much are your teams using motivational interviewing in the work that you're doing now? Uh, so you know, how much and in what ways currently? A definition of exactly what it is. I mean, I've heard the term, and uh, we might be doing it just. <laughs> yeah, so with someone, um, someone who's pretty familiar with the content, how would you summarize motivational interviewing? So it's a set of skills that is really to engage the person to come up with, ask open the questions, to guide the conversation, but really to have them kind of decide what's going on. Mm -hmm. What's, what goals they want to meet, and how would they describe how things are affecting them. So trying to understand, through the patient's own perspective, what's going on, and helping them set goals that they actually have an investment in. Um, other things folks would add to that? I think it's a methodology for behavior change. So, and just to add on to that, it's a specific skill set that works towards behavior change from a patient or a person's perspective. So it is a skill set, and some of the skills within it are things that you might already typically use, but there is a specific framework around it and skill-based food practice. So it is very um, person-centered behavior change, model change for that. There's this very specific definition and certification around it, but there's also skills you can teach so that you're utilizing it. So it's behavior change that originally comes from kind of the mental health Therapy substance world. use, substance use, ther you know, psychotherapy world. But it's been adapted widespread to pretty much every aspect of kind of healthcare and um, other areas. Right. It's an NCQA um, requirement. It's a yeah. standard that we have to meet for yeah. patient care coordination, and we have to make sure that our, our staff are trained in it. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. and um, population health management and self management. Mm -hmm. And um, since we're on this topic, I was going to, it's very hard to send people out to training. And if there's specific um, uh, uh, resources on the internet that I can direct uh, our staff to. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk. There's we'll definitely we'll stuff yeah. that's out there, okay, okay, for sure. Okay, thanks. So um, how much are your teams using motivational interviewing now? Or how? <clears throat> yeah. I, I mean, I just have to just speak for us. We have had an entire training for all of our staff. We actually train monthly. We have an all. -day. That is the best practice, right mm -hmm. there. We have all. We have a clinical meeting, which is a huge chunk of. Um, and we do anything from activities to, you know, listening to our day-to-day -day work and how we can improve on that. Constructive feedback on that because none of us are perfect, it's a constant learn it, learn skill. It's not something that, like you said earlier, you can't learn it and then be done with it. It's constantly, because there's so many different types of people out there and so many different ways to utilize motivational interviewing, then, you know, we are constantly working. This is great to be honest. Yeah, so the recommendation that I make, because I work with programs nationally, is that folks do core training and then they do booster training and they do regular. So the, the teams that I work with try to do a, a booster every month that's really practice-based. So either applying motivational interviewing to cases or doing skills practice um, and getting feedback from peers. Because you get rusty. And I was going to say, even if the clinical staff come up to us, you know, we really try to say, how could you have asked that, you know, how can we ask that differently, or how can we look at that differently to really help them grow and for all of us to have always a constant 
um, theme and have that always on our mind. You, well, what discipline is this in? Uh, is it primary care? Is oh, it we, we, we work, um, it's the clinician staff at the insurance. So we do a lot of telephonic calls. Um, all of our clinicians, social workers, um, nursing staff. Uh -huh. It's all of our interaction with our members, our uh -huh. patients. Yay. I see, I should just call Blue Cross of Vermont and say screw <laughs> Massachusetts. I'm like, I'm going to be so for me when I have a customer. Well, disclosure, it's met with lots of groaning from the clinical yeah. staff. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure we're done with this yet. Yes. No. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been trying to get buy-in because people, I mean, I, I hear this all the time. People are like, oh, we had a half-day training. And I'm like, no. Did, did you learn how to, you know, be a chef by taking a half-day training? Did you learn how to be a potter by training for a half a day? It's not that kind of a thing at all. That's right. Yeah, um, here and there. I was just going to ask you to repeat because we are struggling too with how to keep it going. <laughs> and you mentioned core training, booster training, and you said a third monthly, time. monthly skills practice. And your booster training is part of that, or quarterly. Usually, okay. the, the skills training, like the, I mean, it, when people say, "What would you recommend if resources were not the issue?" Foundation training, quarterly, like a half day, more in depth. And then, and, booster and then booster monthly 90 minutes to two hours. That's mm -hmm. what we, that's like the Cadillac. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. So I just want to say, so I can speak for SASH and, and some collaborative training that we did. So we have this built into one of our core principles and we struggle to find enough resources to keep it up and consistently train. We did do a, a collaborative training as Jeff, I think three years ago now, where we did the six month, we tried to do a peer leader training. We used some mint certified trainers who are in Vermont and you know, a full day on either end, monthly calls in between, so that we had peer leaders in the community. And this wasn't just SASH, you know, it had, um, had people from WIC and had economic services, it had AAAs, home health. It was this great cross section. It was like the ideal training environment. And then, but getting those peer leaders who were actually field level staff to be able to keep doing these peer trainings and monthly. It's a big commitment. Huge commitment. I think Jen and maybe a couple others are our only peer leader trainers left in the state. She's getting requests to go out of state and continue this training. Yeah. And we can't even keep our 140 staff in the state trained. trained. So we really struggle with this. And I know a lot of other organizations in the state all need this training. It's NCQA, it's everything else. Um, and we struggle. And then the second thing I just want to say is, this is a good business model. Can we hire you? <laughs> we state. struggle. I mean, we like, struggle like everybody else. Yeah. Uh, we just have made a commitment to it. We invested amazing. in a, you know, 40-hour training, and then we did um, an on-site. We had Dr. Kathal from Minnesota come and do an on-site with all of our staff, and so we don't have the tool in our system that we could use the red light, green light to kind of do the acuity that goes with this. But we're hoping to get that maybe in 2018, I think. Um, but you know, we've had the training. It's an integrated case mo case management mm -hmm. training, and it's I don't know if you've heard about it, but he's done quite a bit of research on it. And so he came himself with actually um, a mental health uh, case manager that did the training. That was really important to us to have a medical. He's actually a psychiatrist and a internist mm -hmm. and so to have the mental health because you know our model is that we see the whole person and we're really it's not about the diagnosis we want people to really be like I'm a social worker I can take any case I'm an RN I can take any case we don't have it's not getting silos like, right yeah. yeah and even though we say that we have to constantly talk about it people want to revert back to their old thinking yeah. and we say let's take a deep breath yeah. you're you doing change management right mm -hmm. you can do this let's yeah. talk through it and this is such and a huge part of that it's yeah huge it helps a lot i mean so a couple things on that point i think the scale up of motivational interviewing and training is challenging i'm working on a statewide project in massachusetts for something similar and we have um we have five modules of training that are public, which I can send you. And also, if you're looking to do motivational interviewing training of trainers, that's something that I also do. So we'll be in touch and we'll, we can share resources. We don't have any money. We just like to hire people for free. <laughs> 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 I can send you all this stuff. Okay, that's good. Um, so I think it, it surprised me in some way because, um, I mean, I'm trained as a, a mental health clinician. So this is sort of how I was trained to work with people, right? And so. Um, it was really interesting to see that people who are totally bought into their staff doing motivational interviewing focused behavior change work with clients reverted back to being directive and punitive as supervisors. And I was like, hmm, this is interesting.
interesting. Why does this happen? Like, if we know it works with clients, why do we not do it with our staff? And I think, um, so I've, I've, I've been convening these conversations with supervisors to talk about um, just how important it is to, if you really want staff to practice motivational interviewing, it needs to be integrated, like you're talking about, throughout the team, all the way up the food chain. Um, it needs to be regularly practiced. And I think you know staff will do as much of what we model as what we recommend, more of what we model than what, than what we recommend. And so um, to me, I feel like my staff over the years we've worked together have, got, have learned motivational interviews, they went to trainings, we did practice, but also all of us in leadership positions use it all the time. And that's how we you know, have reduced staff burnout, we've reduced turnover, like people feel really good about their work because we're working with them proactively around their barriers to success and their barriers to professional development. It makes a huge difference in the quality of the supervisory relationships. That's my opinion. You can feel free to challenge me as we go. And I think it's interesting when you say that and then the people that are up here for you talk it but don't understand don't, yeah. that that takes daily practice practice and it's and you can't just now tell them what to do because you're changing how you think and how you speak yes. and I'm letting them be a part of this conversation, meaning staff and it changes power dynamics. Right. And they're like, wow, I don't know why it takes so long. Well <laughs> <laughs> because you don't do it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But another component of that, I agree with you in mental health training, it was kind of natural, totally natural. Yet as a parent, I go home, I have no problems doing it as a supervisor. I see myself, why can I not do that to my kids? And so there's all those components of your emotional stress and where you fall into, and so I watch yeah. all the time, but. Yes, I mean, I think really what, what I have seen working with supervisors is that when we are poorly supported, when we're under stress, when we're fearful about consequences, we, we move out of collaboration and into being more directive and controlling. And th th that's not always a problem, but that's usually, you know, in parenting stress. I'm like, well, you know, my, my partner and I argue often, and I'm like, how is it that I'm such a good listener at work? And I come home, and all she ever says is, how come you never listen to me? I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm a paid professional <laughs> And often these supervisory conversations are uncomfortable right. yeah. because you have to give someone bad feedback, you have to fire someone, you have to um, ask someone uncomfortable questions about boundary crossing. You have to, um, you know, most of these things are not things that you're like, wow, I'm really looking forward to this conversation, you know? Um, so, are there, are, so it sounds like most folks have some foundation. You all are pretty integrated in terms of ongoing process of using motivational interviewing. Other sites, how, how does it factor in? Not, not much here. No? Middle? Middle. Okay. All right. Cool. So, um, so this is, <laughs> so I, I wanted to do a summary of both what um, Carla and her team taught in their um, foundation training. This is basically a summary of my five motivational interviewing models modules in one slide. So I want to do this quickly if we can. And if this is new to you, don't worry. Like this is not a motivational interviewing training, so you can get it elsewhere. You can ask questions to me or to colleagues. And if this is familiar, just help me go through this quickly, okay? So in motivational interviewing, who has heard of ORs? All right, somebody who knows ORs, just tell me what they what they stand for and why do we like them? Open okay. question. Yeah? yeah. concepts really concrete so you know when our staff have been learning we um, we observe each other and actually do 
marking down of, um, you know, in, a, in this conversation, how many affirmations did you use? Did you do a summary statement? What, what, what kind of reflections did you use as a way of really making concrete how well someone's doing with the practice skills? Um, so affirmations, someone want to tell me what they are? Just clarifying what you And a little strength-based, I think, you know, mm -hmm. like, Somebody's like, oh, I'm falling apart. You know, you go, oh, it sounds like you are able to express that really well, but you're struggling here. Yeah, it sounds like you're saying whatever. Oh, that's reflections, that's actually. Right. So yeah. affirmations is just looking for strengths. So it may be, thanks for coming into the appointment, or I really appreciate that you got your scripts filled since we met last. Or if we're thinking about it in terms of staff, it may be, I think you're doing a really fabulous job working with your new pediatric patient. Pediatric patients, even if it's someone who's struggling in other areas of their work. So um, reflections is what you were talking about. So just a way of clarifying that what the person said and what you heard are the same. Um, and I feel like life is a giant game of telephone. So the number of times that, I notice this even in simple <coughs> things like I make a plan with a friend and they think we're meeting one place and I think we're meeting somewhere else. And I'm like, that, there was no emotional content. It was just like, I'll be at this place and then they're somewhere else. So to, to make sure we're on the same page. And then um, I feel like, Summaries are the most straightforward. So how, how would you summarize a summary? What's a summary? Saying back what you've heard over the last 20 minutes allows the person to kind of hear back what they've kind of been saying. So you kind of pull the key points. Yeah. yeah. And this is really helpful in a team meeting. It can be really helpful in an individual supervision meeting or a case review to be like, OK, what are the factors? What are the strategies we're going to use? What are you going to do? What am I going to do? Um, really to make sure that, that both we, we're remembering the important stuff and that everybody is clear on what the follow-up is. So that's the flow. And the other S, which um, has gotten left out of some trainings, is um, silence. <laughs> and again, when you're talking about a rushed clinic environment, silence is not something that has a particularly good reputation. But I have found. When you're working with people around complex behavior change, just giving it a little space and time often is what yields the, um, the aha moments. Mm -hmm. Really helpful. OK. So what does this have to do with any of this, with um, behavior change? If you think about it in terms of um, working with staff around behavior change, how is this kind of thing helpful? With our clients or as a supervisor? Either. I, mean, I was just thinking when you're talking about affirmations, like the, there's actually a physician in Vermont who's a great um, trainer, a mint trainer on motivational interview, but when you're talking about affirmations, one great example I think he uses, he would say patient families might get upset with him, but if you're talking about someone who is a smoker, talking about a behavior change to maybe quit smoking, and he would talk about, you know, what is it that you like about smoking? Tell me about, tell me about when you smoke, and he might say, well, at work, I, you know, I smoke that this time of day and this time of day, and I go outside and with my friends. And an affirmation would be, "Wow, it sounds it sounds like it's a really great time for you to be with friends and get some fresh air. You know, be outside. Right? It's a social time for you. So that's an affirmation. And it, and so working with someone, you're going to not say smoking is bad for you. You could die. It's expensive. You're saying, what a great time in the day for you to be with other people and to chat. And, and that's important when we're working with clients to say, I acknowledge that what you're doing is really important to you and has value. Yeah. And then we're going to get to a point where I'd say, so what, how do we keep some parts of this behavior that are really fantastic and maybe lessen the parts that aren't as great about it? Absolutely. So that's what I see as the benefits really get someone to mm -hmm. invest it in maybe stopping smoking. Well, so I, I think the, the basic premise of all of this is all of us do things that are bad for us every day. Whether that's you know being a jerk on the road, whether that's drinking four cups of coffee with too much sugar, whether that's you know smoking, drinking, being mean to our loved ones, like it's not an exclusive purview of people with health issues to be self-destructive. It's part of the human condition. So we assume that all behaviors have pros and cons, and that it's our responsibility as um, collaborators to understand the pros and the cons of why someone's doing what they're doing. So I think for most people, that's not a really radical idea. But when you think about it in terms of staff, it gets more interesting. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I think about some of the performance issues that folks on my team have had. Um, bad documentation, uh, lateness to meetings, um, seeing their caseload really unevenly, boundary issues, um, and all of the things they do that either are not best practice or are against policy and protocol 
have pros. So if I go in and I say con, 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 it doesn't usually go really well. So I think that the argument I want to make to all of you, and I'm going to give you some tools as we go through this afternoon to, to practice this, is when we're working with staff, we have to talk about what's going well, about what they're already doing, usually before they're willing to consider making a change, either in how they're working with clients or how they're working professionally um, with their colleagues. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, and I feel like, tell me your name again. Stephanie. Stephanie, so I think you did a really nice summary of harm reduction, so I'm going to just jump us there. Um, so harm reduction is the idea that you can reduce the negative impact of a behavior without having to stop it. So you can reduce smoking without having to quit, and that's beneficial. Um, you can use a seatbelt instead of not speeding, and there is benefit to that. So it's, it's thinking creatively with people about how to mitigate the negative consequences of whatever their current set of health choices are. Okay. Um, and anyone want to say anything about stages of change? I mean, we could do a half day on stages of change, and I'm not going to because you've had it. Stages of change. Yeah, so you, you've heard it. Um, how is it helpful to you? How do you use it in your work? Or do you? I mean, we do not great. Um, we actually have tools that are supposed to target the education for the behavior change stage that the person's at. Mm -hmm. Um, n we're not great at that piece of it yet, but really knowing that you can't really go to this where you want to go if they're over here, mm -hmm. you got to go where they're at and let them take you. Yeah. So I, mean, I think it sort of harkens back to what Carla was saying earlier about assessment, is this ongoing assessment around how ready somebody is to make a change and what their priorities are. So um, I'm just trying to think of a, of a good think, example. Well, yeah. I think a good example. So we do ongoing assessment with folks. And, and you might find, you know, the nurse might be reviewing their assessment and say, so you're a really high nutritional risk for this and also, you know, um, your diabetes left or whatever, whatever it is. And they might say, I've eaten this way for 85 years and I'm not changing now. But you did mention that my high blood pressure I've really been struggling with and maybe walking, I'm, I'm open to doing a little bit more exercise. Yes. Great, so they are not gonna change how they're eating, they're not even pre-contemplating about that. So scrap nutrition. But they're willing to start walking. Great, so let's let's do that. Yeah. Because you're not gonna get anywhere if you say you really should change your diet, they're not going to. Right, right. So don't, right. 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 don't waste your time. time. Right. I don't know who was here for the course, do you remember we showed a health coaching video and they show uh, um, the coach shows a paper and it has choices, yeah, yeah, like, like yeah. which of these things, if any, would you like to work on? And it's yes. pictures, exercise, diet, mm -hmm. stop smoking, take my med, you know, and so it's the same, same thing, thing you're talking about, right? Like, it, they have power to choose what they want to focus on and you don't waste your time, like, trying to convince them of something in a particular area that they're not ready to make a change and in. And they can actually be successful. Yeah, right, and then the success ideally yeah. snowballs because yeah. you're like, okay, wait, so I got my high blood pressure under control. Yeah. Now yeah. I feel maybe more confident to tackle something more challenging. Yes, right. yes, right. This is great. So that's our like seven minute crash course yeah. to motivational interviewing. <laughs> Comments or questions before we proceed? <laughs> um, and again, if you want more on this, I have so much material, I'm happy to send you stuff that's all public. And there's stuff in the core training that's going to be posted on the DBHA website from our training as well. So I want to sort of give you um, a little, little theatrical demonstration <laughs> of um, what this might look like in the context of supervision. So I wonder, does anybody um, have somebody on their team, like supervise someone that has a behavior that you would like them to change? No. <laughs> <laughs> What would be an example of a staff behavior that you would love to change if you could? Oh, I have one. Yeah. I have, but we have a lot of policies and procedures and just ways to go about things within, internally. Mm -hmm. Like how to follow, we have one employee that, oh, she goes rogue. She's like, I just skip all the policies and procedures and I go right to this person because she'll get a different answer. She'll, everything will be done in five minutes and we're all like, how did, what did you do? Oh, I, went to, I went to so and so, and they just did it for me. I'm like, okay, so you didn't follow any prop. Like, okay, we gotta let's take a step back. Oh. You know what's happening, <laughs> and it'll always be 
it's not usually the right, what she got is not usually, like someone liked it because it was quick, but it's not the right, everybody went wrong in the scenario. So it creates because, systems problems yeah. if that happens on a regular basis. Exactly. Okay, so would you be willing to um, role play your rogue employee with me? <laughs> So I'm going to do three, three takes oh, on this, <laughs> and um, then we'll talk about sort of what, what went well. So you want to give yourself a name? You can just call me. Okay, I will. So I just decide which of these I'm going to do. Okay. Um, so Amy, look, we have to talk. Um, you know, I heard that basically you went rogue again, and uh, how many, I don't know how many times? What do you mean by that? You don't know what I mean by that? So we've had this conversation a bunch of times about what the policies and procedures are around resolving an issue like the one that came up last week. And I heard again from people that you didn't follow the process, you right, went around the process. The processes are ridiculous. But you don't get to make them up the way you want them to be. I know when I get it done faster. But it creates problems for everybody else when you do that. So what I'm saying is I'm giving you a verbal warning about this rogue behavior. You need to follow the policies and procedures. And if this happens again, you're going to be put on probation. Do you have any questions? I mean, I do because in Amy's brain, this is how this works. I get it, but you, you work here. And, it, and you don't get to make it work the way you want it to work. You need to do it the way that it's written for everyone. Um, look, right, I have I another mean, meeting I'll I have try, to go to. But I appreciate I'm that. I'm not sure how. You know, <laughs> I'll try. Right, you're, if you have a problem, you can talk to your colleagues because they seem to be able to do this. I know, but they don't do it right. Conversation for another day. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that was take one. <laughs> take one. <laughs> so, so stay. <laughs> about how it's um, gotten resolved? I have no concerns, no. no. None? No. Are you sure? I mean, I feel like I know exactly what I need to know. I mean, hmm. Is there that, a that's problem? I mean, I'm, I'm glad it's gotten taken care of. And, oh, you know, I've heard a few things. Like, I, you know, me I too. Are you glad I'm here? <laughs> <laughs> are you glad you have me here? I just go right to the, I solve the problem. But I'm glad that it's taken care of. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so number three. Hi, Amy. How are you? Good. How are you? Do you have some time to talk with me today about some policy and procedure stuff? Oh, no. You, you, were you anticipating this conversation was going to happen? Well, I, I mean, I did go see someone this morning. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit about what happened from your perspective? Well, people came to me and asked me a question, and I know there's a process, but I know this person in customer service who will just do it for me because they know me and it's my they they trust me, and so they'll just so you have a hookup. Do it. I do. I have hookups all over the company. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so um, I'll look you up. <laughs> <laughs> You know in my role I cannot have a hookup. Um, so, t so tell me a little bit, what's the advantage of kind of going to someone you know as opposed to following the flow that's expected? You know, I mean, I just think that these people don't know and I want to solve the problem quick. Okay, and so it gets you to a solution more quickly. Yes, and in my brain, that makes me valuable and I just do, I get it done. Okay. So you have some pride in being a good problem I solver. Do. I do. Okay. It's very important to me. Got it. it. And also, it sounds like from what you're saying that there's some way that you don't have faith that your colleagues will get things done in a in a right and timely way. You have no idea. Okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I have some idea, but yes, <laughs> some concerns in that area. 
So, so it sounds like there are some good um, advantages to kind of doing the, the, the rogue approach that um, it gets stuff done, that you, you know, feel a sense of pride in being able to resolve a problem, mm -hmm. and that you're, it doesn't put you in that uncomfortable I mean, territory. I mean, I just want to, can I just tell you that no one thinks how Amy's brain thinks. Okay. So that's why I have to do it my way, because I get it. All the other people need the, pro the process, but I don't need it. So, so Amy, do a little thought experiment with me. So, if if we think about there being any disadvantages to um, to using a a, a side step as opposed to following the, the policy and procedure, what what do you see as possible negative consequences from that? I mean, I guess some people wouldn't understand what I'm doing, and everyone, the other departments might see that I do it different, and so. I could see how that could cause some confusion. Okay, but so there's some risk for confusion. confusion. Okay, so it's, there's risk for confusion for the people that you collaborate with. Mm -hmm. um, what yeah. else? They love me, you know. Who? <laughs> the, all these people. They think I'm the best. At what you do? Person here. Yeah. I'm just telling you, now, I don't like to toot my own horn, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in terms of other consequences, there is, there's the confusion factor. Is there anything else that you have heard or that you could imagine would be negative related to this um, I mean, approach? I can tell you don't like it. I haven't said anything yet. <laughs> you know I'm gonna say but, something, but we're not there yet. I mean, I can tell it upsets you, and it does make my, co it, you know what it does? It makes when people come over to the department, they just seek me out, because they know I'm gonna, just give them what they want. So I can see, and it makes other people mad that okay. they have to follow the process. So I can see we're there. So it potentially creates some discord with the other people in your department. It does. Does it create more work for you because people come to you directly? Um, yeah, but I really like that. Okay. So there's something about feeling in, like you can resolve the problems and you have that ability. I That's, love that. Okay. That is really important to me. Cool. So Amy, are you open to hearing some feedback from me on this issue? I mean, yeah. Okay, cool. So I think what I want to say to you is I really appreciate your enthusiasm for both efficiency and problem solving and sort of taking pride in being able to get results in a timely fashion. I think that's um, an asset and like one of the reasons we hired you in the first place. Um, but the feedback I want to give you is that um, the, the not following the protocol really is creating problems. If you were like your own company, it would be one thing, but you're working as part of a team and a much larger entity. So when you don't follow the flow, it, it not only um, creates confusion for other people, but it also, um, I think there's a sense of unfairness. Because I think, you know, you said my brain works a certain way, but everybody's brain works differently. So the rest of the staff don't follow the policies and procedures necessarily because that's how they would do it, but that we've sort of agreed to like, <coughs> these are the rules of how we work together. Not everyone has Amy. Well, but they, they have different brains that also maybe have something useful. So, um, so we should talk about that. We should. We definitely should. So, <laughs> what I'd like to do is for us to strategize together in the time that we have left about how we could make sure that the problems get resolved efficiently in a way that doesn't create discord on the team. Because that, for, as, from a program manager perspective, that's really my priority. And I don't want to cause problems. I appreciate that. So, cool. I so. <laughs> so, <laughs> if we had more time, we would go through that whole thing. You can go back for it. Was That's yeah. real. Yeah. Amy, I really appreciate that you were not, you were going for it. <laughs> it took me a long time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Finally, the person just said to me the other day, "I just want you to know, I was going to go rogue, but I didn't." Um, <laughs> behavior change is afoot, huh? Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> about those three approaches. What what did you like or not like among them? That person you clearly weren't using. No, I didn't know. The time, the agenda. Time, agenda. Yeah. Like, and how? There's no reason to bother you ever again because I'm just going to continue doing my thing. Right. Yeah, because there's not much, no place to go from there. Right. And how, how did she respond to that? She just kept trying to bring her point across, but then you just kind of walked away from her. So she just kept trying to. Well, and I think that there are people who are brought up, I mean, I think of it as kind of a patriarchal idea that if you're the boss, you get to 
boss everyone and yeah. you tell them what to do and if you're you know that's her making excuses and you gotta lay down the law and go onward right yeah um and i think that you know if this is the fifth time we've had this conversation it may be time to you know raise the stakes but it didn't really facilitate much of a conversation yeah. what about the second one you're a little bit passive aggressive i feel like yeah yeah like you started out okay you asked an open-ended question and then, but then you, you got really, yeah, you got passed across. And also she left with no understanding that that was a problem. You <laughs> yeah. actually said, okay. And she's probably right. like, <laughs> she, she, <laughs> she gets me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, I feel like it was somewhere between passive and passive aggressive in that there's an issue, but I didn't feel comfortable to address it with her directly, or I wanted to avoid a conflict, mm -hmm. if I could. Mm -hmm. um, and that was maybe a little bit of an extreme example, but I've gone into supervision with people, and you're like, there's something they want to talk to me about, but I don't know what it is, and I don't know how to get them to bring it up. Right. And you're like, this is really awkward. Um, so the, the lack of directness in the name of saving face often creates way more confusion and stress than just being more straightforward. Mm -hmm. So um, what about the third version? Notice it took a lot more time. Mm -hmm. But it was about her being valuable and her about strengths mm -hmm. and how it was affecting others and herself. It could affect yourself and the team. Mm -hmm. You're validating her ethics, however, just really having her look at a very you know, different view. And taking respect for everybody. Like, that's great your brain works that way, but. Everybody's brain works. I've actually said that. <laughs> <laughs> or even, so, say yeah. Like, even, like, some of those processes are annoying, right? I mean, like, yeah, yeah, they're inefficient, they're, 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 they're stupid. stupid. God, dude, this really is going to slow everything down. Why would I do that? And, and sometimes we work in these systems where we don't have the ability to change all those pro Like, even as a supervisor, you're, you might say, like, yeah, this is kind of a, annoying. We have to go through this, but we do. But so it validates some of the, like, there's a reason to do some of what she was doing, right? And, and it's not like we just want to completely right. say, like, everything you're doing is worthless. It's like you, you said, just trying to... The other departments, too, when you do that, so. It's just like thinking of, like, the bigger implications, but, but at base there was something okay about what she was doing, theoretically, right? It just... Well, so, I mean, it's, I think what, what I've noticed in a lot of the behavior change conversations is the pros for the current behavior usually are quick fix. So it's like if I smoke, I feel less stressed right now. Right. And the con is, in 20 years, I might have lung cancer. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the pro here is I go rogue, I get the problem solved, everyone loves me, I feel accomplished, I go home happy. The con is I'm making problems in relationships and in systems over a long period of time. So you can see how when you weigh them out, sometimes the pros win. Right. And that that's important to understand and acknowledge. It's not that people just are trying to be jerks most of the time. Like, she's right. a smart she's person, right? Out. Yeah, there's a payoff for the, yeah. for the behavior, right? <laughs> good, good, good. So, um, so in that last one, how did you see motivational interviewing at work? So pros and cons was part of it. What else? Yeah. Open questions. Yep. Affirmation. Mm -hmm. Maybe summarized. Cool. And you asked them at all, which is a good I have found that to be really helpful. I really love when people ask me permission because sometimes I say no. You know, like I, for years I didn't go to the doctor because I didn't want to get weighed. Mm -hmm. And I've now said that is not a good reason not to go to the doctor, but sometimes I don't want to get weighed. So I'll be like, you can weigh me. Do not tell me what that number is because I can't deal with it. And I don't want to have a conversation about it. So that's it. Yeah. And it enables me to go to the doctor, right, but right. not yeah. to feel some sense of control over what happens. Um, so I think for staff that can be really helpful too, especially if you know you have a relationship over time, and some of the stuff you have to address is um, it's uncomfortable. And reality, what if she you shared back? You know, my son just got in a car accident, and I got the call 15 minutes ago, and I've got to leave in half an hour. I mean, it may be a really bad time to have yes. this conversation. Yes, yeah, exactly. There is a reality check of like this is really not going to be successful. Yeah, yeah, it's that assessment, that yeah. ongoing yeah. assessment, moment to moment. I think I just don't, I think the ask permission is something that I need to work on, and, and it was interesting in a supervisory role to do MI because I think that I'm really good in a client situation, and I tried to I've tried to do this very open-ended approach, um, and some of my staff makes them very uncomfortable actually, and I was surprised by that, and I was like, why are you uncomfortable? I'm not asking open-ended questions or talking because I think they were like, where is she going with this? Like, what's your agenda? What's your agenda? Where are you going? And I was like, oh god. 
fun. I'm just trying to like really listen and I want to hear where you're at and what are you liking and you know whatever. But I, I don't think I asked permission. And now as we were talking, I was watching this. I was like, I need to think about what, how would I phrase, what am I asking permission of, you know? And then also I'm thinking about we're getting near year end, reviews are coming up. Am I really going to say, would you like to have your review conversation here? Because that's, <laughs> the, the answer, no, is you can't ask a question that you can't hear no to. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. So it's a different right. question. Mm -hmm. So you really have me thinking about how am I going to do this and that, you know, whatever. But thank you for that. I, have, I, I don't know what I'm asking permission for, but I think that was the missing piece to me being just yeah. really open-ended. They, yeah. they all of a sudden got really nervous. And I was like, well, and I think, too, if, you have, if you've worked a certain way and you start to switch your approach, people get unsettled. Yes. And yeah. so I sometimes will say, I just learned some new stuff and I want to practice it. So if I'm behaving differently, right. I'm trying some stuff out. You can tell me how you, yeah. if you like it or you don't like it or how you feel about it. Right. I'm either um, like too directive or too open-ended. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the... <laughs> I know, I've been a student of Buddhism for a lot of years, and I think the middle path is actually really challenging, because it's easy to let everything go, and it's easy, to, for some of us, it's easy to be a hard-ass. Yeah. But that middle ground where you're like, no, we're going to have clear boundaries and clear feedback, but I'm not just going to give you a blank check to do whatever you want all the time. Really? It's uncomfortable. It can be really uncomfortable. And it's interesting when you ask permission of that person. I know for me, I've already thought about it a long time before that we actually have the conversation. So giving them time, they probably know what you're going to talk about. So yeah. giving them time to think about it because I've already thought. Yeah, you're prepared. I'm prepared. So it's like, yeah. I never thought well, I've had people sometimes say no, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to bring this up you know, when we right. meet next because there's some things that are important for me to bring up with you when you're ready. Yeah. Um, it's not like knows the... No, it's not the final answer. Right. It can be the answer right now. Yeah. 